I apologize to Gotham that he has to uh, switch uh, a slot for me uh, with me. But it's also very nice that he gave a very nice uh, context of uh, of uh, testing the nature of gravity, and I think he gave a very strong argument that uh, the quantization of Newtonian gravity and the, the existence of gravitons are so closely related, and therefore is actually uh, very strong already if you're able to test the quantum nature of Newtonian gravity. And then I can start from my first slide, uh, where you know around 2017 there are two papers that. Uh, uh, was very exciting, that made uh, the community very excited about testing the quantum nature of gravity. And in these papers, it was proposed that uh, if you make experiments where entanglement can be et established by a gravity, then it'll give a test of the quantum nature. And over the past uh, years, there has been a lot of discussions, and I would like to highlight this uh, uh, another work, which uh, put the testing of quantum nature in a very rigorous uh, footing basically saying that uh, a quantum gravity uh, would be a quantum channel in between uh, two quantum uh, multiple quantum systems. And therefore, uh, on the other hand, a classical gravity should be an LOCC channel. And therefore, you could distinguish uh, whether gravity is quantum or classical by just testing whether the channel uh, established by gravity is LOCC or not. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, experimentally, I would like to say that uh, if you want to test the nature of gravity, it's a very hard experiment because gravity is a very weak uh, interaction. Uh, for example, you know, some time ago, uh, Caffrey and Taylor, for example, considered this thought experiment where they uh, considered uh, interacting uh, uh, balls <laughs> via Newtonian gravity, and they try to estimate how long it takes uh, gravity to transfer quantum information. And the, the relevant time scale for two harmonic oscillators interacting via gravity is given by this omega g squared over omega zero. Omega zero is the um, original eigenfrequency of the two oscillators. And this omega g is a characteristic gravitational frequency, which is related to the density of the material where the masses are made from. And then the time scale delta at which the information uh, sloshes back and forth between the two balls will be given by omega g squared over 2 omega 0, which is a very, very small number. And then furthermore, uh, many uh, papers have further estimated that if you want to have such an experiment, the requirement for testing uh, entanglement experimentally would be given by this, where the mechanic, the decoherence, uh, the, the relaxation time scale gamma, the decay rate, must be less than h bar omega g squared over kBT, if you consider the thermal fluctuations, thermal decoherence. And therefore, it makes, uh, in practice, uh, testing the quantum nature of gravity uh, very uh, difficult. So, um, so this partly motivated us to think about uh, the 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 content of this talk. So, so the the motivation for this talk is basically twofold. Uh, one is to set up a a model of classical gravity in such a way that it is the target to test against. Okay, it doesn't mean that I necessarily believe that gravity is a classical interaction, but I wanted to see how far we're able to uh, push. Uh, in terms of having a classical version of gravity so that it's meaningful to make a test. And the other thing we will see is that it turns out when you consider uh, classical gravity, um, the effect of classical gravity signatures can be actually easier to test than uh, gravitational entanglement uh, via the usual quantum gravity. So let me start from this very, uh, very old <laughs> way of uh, formulating classical gravity, which is the first thing you would try, which is to say, well, let's consider gravity as a classical uh, field, uh, which is driven by the matter density that is uh, uh, in, the in your experiment. And then for the, for the matter density, you take an expectation value. And one of the interesting features when you do this is that you will immediately introduce a self-gravity effect. So for example, if you, if you think about a test mass in quantum gravity and your test mass is 
uh, in the superposition state, your wave function is a superposition of these two, um, three different locations, it'll create a superposition uh, of, of the, the, the wave function can be written as a superposition of different uh, locations, but at each location, the Newtonian gravity field is consistent with that location. So therefore you won't have self gravity. And the only self really uh, interaction is the radiation reaction due to emission of gravitational waves, which is very, very weak. On the other hand, if you have a classical gravity and you take the wave function like this the, to create a gravitational field, then immediately the wave function give you a matter distribution and that distribution would give you a corresponding gravitational potential will. And that will, in that will, your wave function will be evolving, okay? So you have a nonlinear quantum mechanics. And this nonlinearity has one consequence, which is that you have this self-gravity give you a dynamical uh, feature. So of course, there'll be many, many subtleties that would arise from a nonlinear quantum mechanics, but it's the subject of today's talk to try to struggle with myself to resolve that, Ho hopefully. Hopefully, and I will make connections to the existing, the currently existing other uh, theories. But for the moment, let's stay with this nonlinear model because it turns out to have a very, a much stronger experimental signature, uh, which we shouldn't be uh, missing because it's a very hard experiment. So the way to think about why self-gravity can amplify the effect of um, <laughs> in your experiment is to think that uh, actually if you have a macroscopic um, mass, maybe for example a crystal, maybe it doesn't have to be a crystal, but the idea is that um, if you think about if you have a macroscopic object, the mass of the object is actually concentrated near the equilibrium positions of the nuclei um, on the lattice. Or if you don't have a lattice, they still have, each has an equilibrium position. And the extent of motion um, of these nuclei around the equilibrium uh, position are characterized by the Debye frequency. Okay, so basically it is, can be modeled as a harmonic, maybe not harmonic, but an oscillator with a quantum uncertainty that is given by h bar over m omega Debye. And m is the mass of each um, nuclei. Uh, the bi-frequency, and then you can estimate that the, 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 the scale at which the mass is concentrated is like a hundred times smaller than the separation between these atoms. So therefore, if you literally compute the matter density um, that is you need to use for the self-gravitational potential, you find out that if your mass, center of mass of the object moves less by 10 to the minus 12 meters, then you're in a harmonic potential well, and that well is characterized by a so-called Schrodinger-Newton frequency, and that Schrodinger-Newton frequency is characterized not by the density, the mean density of the mass, but by this highly amplified matter density near the lattice sites. And uh, for silicon, this could even be 100 times bigger than the mean, uh, than the frequency you compute from the mean density. And so therefore, you know, this really gives you a very interesting uh, amplified effect for doing experiments. So, so let's think about the picture. Okay, if, if you think about, let's use this uh, Schrodinger-Newton model. Let's say that our macroscopic test mass is, has a center of mass. The center of mass um, is subject to this um, potential potential will due to the self-gravity. Um, what, what's the picture? Well, the, the picture is simple, okay? So basically, if you, if, you, if you think about preparing a Gaussian quantum state, and uh, then maybe a coherent uh, state or a squeezed uh, state in your phase space. So basically, if you draw that, um, the contour of your uh, Wigner function in the phase space, uh, then in the usual, uh, quantum mechanics, that that uh, Wigner function would just rotate in the phase space, fixing the shape. On the other hand, in this Schrodinger-Newton uh, theory, or in this classical gravity uh, model, uh, because you have this potential will, 
around which the self-gravity is uh, gravitating. What happens is that the center uh, of the, the mean value of the x and p, the center of this uh, contour is rotating at one frequency, which is what you measure classically from this uh, oscillator. On the other hand, the quantum uncertainty uh, will be having an elevated, a higher frequency uh, quantified by this Schrodinger-Newton frequency. So therefore, it gives a very strong experimental signature compared with, for example, testing the uh, entanglement due to mutual gravity. OK, so so far, this is the good thing about the theory. And then it comes uh, the, the problem. OK, <laughs> there are, OK, and then in the, but OK, so let's, let's first more think about the experimental signatures. So, so we, if we put this Schrodinger-Newton model into a um, optomechanics model, so you have light beam monitoring the motion of a test mass, and then the, inter, uh, the light has a certain uh, pumping power. And then, you, for example, you want to measure the phase modulation of the light due to the motion of the mirror. So here, for the uh, Hamiltonian of the movable mirror, we can just have the usual Hamiltonian plus this self-gravity piece, OK? The mass the, you know, oscillates around the expectation value of the uh, wave function. Wave function self-gravitates. And then you couple the amplitude of the light field uh, to the displacement of the mirror. You can write down an Heisenberg equations uh, for, for the mass and for the light field. Okay, so if I walk you through these equations, these two equations are for the outgoing light, how the amplitude and phase of the outgoing light relates to amplitude of the incoming light and also phase of the incoming light and plus a response to the motion of the mirror, displacement of the mirror. And then the mirror has this dynamics where the most prominent feature is that the momentum operator, um, the, <laughs> there's an additional self-interacting force here due to the Schrodinger-Newton effect. And then from here, you see that, oh, if I take expectation value, you find out the expectation value, which quantifies the center of the Wigner function. It rotates around in uh, with one frequency, omega c, uh, the classical frequency, the classical one, which is the one you observe, measure. <laughs> Um, with a classical experiment or with any um, other experiment. On the other hand, the quantum uncertainty, okay, the quantum uncertainty s satisfies a different equation because when you take the, uh, the, the uncertainty part of the momentum equation, you gain this additional frequency. And this quantifies uh, this picture. And therefore, if you say, oh, let me compute the spectrum of the outgoing field, um, outgoing phase quadrature of the outgoing light. Well, you'll see two peaks. You have a peak around the omega c, which gives you the thermal noise. On the other hand, you have another peak at the omega q, um, which is elevated by the Schrodinger-Newton frequency. Um, and then this is a very obvious experimental signature. And uh, I, I think this is a <laughs> this is where the the good part of the talk is, which is saying that, OK, um, you, you will have, have a very strong signature. And then the, it becomes a subtlety. The subtlety, and here I would like to mention the, the Feynman's thought experiment again. So the idea is, um, and this argument was given by Don Page uh, many years ago to, to say that, well, when you consider nonlinear quantum mechanics, the wave function that you use to generate the classical field must follow the, the collapse of quantum states. OK, I think he, from his point of view, he doesn't believe the collapse of quantum state. He was coming from the more relative state interpretation of quantum mechanics. And therefore, for him and his collaborator, basically, it, it just means that you're not supposed to do Schrodinger-Newton theory at all. <laughs> so, so his argument is that, OK, he, he will look at uh, uh, two uh, Geiger counters that depends on where a gamma ray, uh, a photon arrives. And depending on where the photon arrives, uh, he will place a ball either up or down, corresponding to the counter one or the two are, are clicking. 
And then if, if you think about the, the, the wave function of the universe, it basically contains um, the counter one clicks and down page thinks that the one, and then he put the ball up or the two clicks, and then he thinks that's the two, and then the down, you put the ball down. So, so if you do nothing to the wave function, if you say, I don't believe in the collapse of wave function, that, that's it, okay? Then what you're supposed to do is to take expectation value of the matter density operator on this entire wave function of the universe. And then gravity would vanish in the middle of the two balls because your universe contains two branches where equally the ball is up and down. And this is obviously absurd. So, so what does it mean? It, it, I think at this stage, you have to make a choice. Uh, if you believe in, uh, if you don't believe that the wave function should be collapsed, or if you, if you just believe that there's a relative state interpretation of quantum mechanics that literally solves, that is the correct theory, then maybe you should just stop. You don't want to think about classical gravity anymore. You don't want to do it. The only, now you only move on to think about classical gravity if you have to admit that there is to some extent, in some way there is a classical reality uh, which chooses one of these components out of the entire wave function of the universe, one way or the other. For example, momentarily you can believe the collapse models, for, for example, or you have some other way, you can remain agnostic. So, okay, and then the, the immediate consequence of this uh, historically is that people said, well, now let's either if you don't collapse the quantum state, but what if you collapse the quantum state? And then people started saying, no, no, if you collapse the quantum state, a nonlinearity would cause a superluminal signal transfer. And this was mentioned by several previous talks, for example, uh, Vivishak's talk on Monday. So the argument is very simple. It basically says, well, when you suppose you have two um, people, uh, two uh, components of entangled uh, objects, A and B, uh, separated spatially, and then if you make, um, they're entangled, and if you make a measurement at A, um, if you collapse the quantum state of the entire system instantly, then the, the, the measurement you made on A, the, not only the result, but also the choice of which measurement you made on A would have a non-trivial effect on the wave function of B, and B will start feeling the experiment that you made right away. Okay, so nonlinear quantum mechanics, literally speaking, if you collapse the quantum state on the time slice, this is obviously not <laughs> gonna work, okay? It violates the superliminal uh, it gives you a superliminal signal transfer. And at this stage, you can say, oh, no, maybe maybe we don't want to have nonlinear uh, quantum mechanics. But I think, on the other hand, the this elevated self-gravity effect is so strong, and we would still want to think a little more uh, whether we can recover this nonlinear quantum mechanics. So I think our thought, uh, me and my collaborators, our thought was to say, well, let's change the meaning of the wave function that we use um, in the Schrodinger-Newton equation in a way that actually will work. And so at the, at the moment, let me, let me just come back to the more <laughs> philosophical context, saying that what's, what's going on with our situation here. So I think we have the quantum domain and then we have our quantum uh, system and we're making a measurement process and now our measurement would give a particular outcome each time we perform that measurement, and we know the probability of that outcome. So what we really want, we don't really have to just take the wave function and collapse the wave function. What we really need to do, what Down Page uh, motivated us to do is to say, well, if you have a classical gravity, um, we have to, the, the classical gravity has to be consistent with the perception that we have for the quantum system that we made by processing the data that we have. So the only thing we need to do is to say, well, if we have a quantum measurement process applied on our quantum device, we should just use the data uh, coming out from our experiment and then use that data uh, to uh, create a classical gravity field. And then that classical gravity field uh, will be able to be consistent 
with our uh, common sense of how gravity behaves. And therefore, it'll be a consistent theory. It'll be, a, um, it'll be experimentally consistent with what we already know about gravity. Okay, so the key is not that we have to literally collapse the wave function, but the key really is we have to take the data, a classical data coming out from the system via our measurements, and we have to use that data to create the gravity field. So, um, you know, and then we, we, we were, then let's consider a situation in quantum physics which actually does uh, do this, namely the quantum feedback control uh, problem, okay? So basically, a, feed, a quantum feedback control is a situation where you have a uh, plant, which is your quantum system, and a controller. The controller can, can modify the Hamiltonian of your quantum system. And what happens here is that you make a certain measurement of a certain quantity x, and then you have the record of your measurements. And then from that record, you process the data with a classical filter and you feedback, and then you change the Hamiltonian of your v. And, and here your classical filter can be very, it can be arbitrary. You know, it's a very, uh, can be a lot of processing. But I think this one has the key features. The key feature we want for modifying Schrodinger Newton to make it work is that we have to gain the classical information uh, relevant in our experiment, and we have to feed it back as a classical field. So here, namely, we change our Hamiltonian, okay? So <laughs> for example, here, our Hamiltonian is h plus a phi, and this phi x of j is the position operator of each mass and the lambda is the parameter that we're able to uh, tweak, okay? So basically, then we wanted to fit the Schrodinger-Newton into the context of quantum feedback control. And, and so this gives us the so-called causal conditional formulation of Schrodinger-Newton. So what we do is we will say, we will still use the Schrodinger-Newton equation, but um, in this expectation value, we, because we're already making a quantum measurement, and from quantum measurement, we're able to compute a conditional quantum state, uh, a conditional quantum state from the data. And we will just use the conditional quantum state of the data to actually construct the gravitational field. And that way, we will not violate causality. On the other hand, it is a classical theory of gravity because uh, it's, um, be because it's just a classical parameters you're tweaking in the Hamiltonian. So therefore, I think it, it, res it kind of reconciles some of the foundational uh, problems. So when you consider this theory for real, <laughs> like in this experimental context, uh, what you do is you can say, well, I still have my movable mirror and then I would have my light beam, I have the same interaction Hamiltonian, but in this Heisenberg equation, um, for the so-called, for this center of the gravitational potential, you have to use your best estimate of where the center of the wave function is, given the measurement data and given the thermal noise, the thermal fluctuations acting on the um, on the mass, okay? So here I'm assuming that what is cl the classical data that I use to generate gravity contains the result of measurement and the thermal force. So in other words, I'm considering the thermal force as a classical quantity as well. So I, I will, I will uh, try to justify this near the end of my talk, okay? But if you, if you think about, if you try to do this, then what happens is that uh, first of all, when you compute the spectrum of the outgoing field, uh, you will only have one peak. <laughs> okay, so the signature of that additional peak becomes a lot weaker. On the other hand, if you look at the details of this curve and how that is different from the curve without considering the Schrodinger-Newton effect, it still can be distinguished um, if your decoherence time scale is less than h bar. Uh, omega s n squared over k b t. Oh, oh, there's a question from Anupam. Maybe we can take a question. Uh, 
Um, Yanbei, I can go and ask you later once you finish it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, you already have a question. Okay, so I try to walk you through very, very subtle uh, concepts. I, I feel like uh, uh, very nervous. So, okay. So, so the idea in this causal conditional picture is that um, the peak disappears, but the shape is different. And now, how does it work? Okay, so here I would like to steal a picture from uh, Marcus Aspermeyer because he has an experimental realization of such a system, a test mass under the continuous monitoring of lights and where he can see a quantum trajectory of the test mass where the green curves are uh, the mean values of X and P over time and the, the blue one is the zero point fluctuation. And in this Schrodinger-Newton theory, what, what happens in this so-called causal conditional Schrodinger-Newton, what happens is that, well, um, the, the green trajectory, the classical expectation value would circle around in phase space at the omega C. And this one is driven by the thermal noise. So therefore that's why the thermal noise peak is around the same frequency omega C, which is the, let's say the bare <laughs> eigenfrequency of your mechanical oscillator. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you look at the other sector of your stochastic uh, master equation, and you look at the, the quantum uncertainty, or the quantum uncertainty of this uh, ellipse is governed by the omega Q. So basically you still have a picture where you have a self-gravity shaping the uncertainty, but then the self-gravity only shapes the uncertainty of the ellipse around its expectation value, but then the expectation value normally walks around in phase space. So therefore it gives you a little more, a lot more difficult, a more subtle experimental signature, but it's still in comparison with, um, with, uh, with the mutual gravity, it is still a stronger effect to observe. So, and then I would like to introduce this even more subtle issue when you think about mutual gravity, if you account for the classical information that can be fed into gravity uh, via uh, this uh, model here, okay? So, um, for example, we consider one of these experiments proposed, thought experiments proposed by Miao, Martinov, and Yang, where basically, it says that you have two mirrors which are close to each other, and then the both driven by light field. On the other hand, what you do with A is you measure the amplitude fluctuation of the light field on A, which gives you the quantum uncertainty of the displacement of A. And then you wanna see whether the quantum uncertainty of A can drive a quantum motion of B via quantum gravity, okay? So, so therefore you measure B's phase fluctuation. So if you do this thought experiment, the expectation at the moment and the expectation by most uh, literature, or maybe maybe not by Vivishak's talk <laughs> on Monday, which uh, I think, but on the other hand, I think if you think about most naively, okay, if you think most naively about it, the picture is that if gravity is classical, then even though the side of A a mirror has a quantum uncertainty of position driven by the quantum radiation pressure is not gonna be transferred to B because you take expectation value before you put the force on B. On the other hand, with this uh, calculation done by uh, Yu Bao Liu, and uh, it turns out that if you use this causal conditional picture of Schrodinger-Newton, you will see that it appears as if you could establish a correlation between the amplitude fluctuation of A light and the phase fluctuation of B. So, which means that it appears as if there were quantum entanglement established by this model. Okay, so this was a little bit puzzling to, to the us, but then it, it turns out you can you have to think this way. <laughs> okay, so so the way is when when you make a when you try to test whether your systems are entangled you make a measurement on the amplitude fluctuation of light of A. But when you make a measurement on that amplitude fluctuation, you convert it into a classical information. And that classical information can be used to reconstruct a classical trajectory for A. And that classical trajectory can gravitate and cause 
classical motion of beat. So therefore, there is a channel for transferring information from A to B. What you're transferring is not information. It's transferring is classical information. But nevertheless, it could have some signatures that could pretend as quantum gravity. Now, OK, OK, that's why, you know, but what happened to this LOCC argument, OK? So I think in this context, we can explain this in this way. We can say, well, it, gravity can be a classical channel, but maybe the channel itself can depend on the setting of your experiments. So, so for example, here, if you use this causal conditional formulation, what, what happens is that um, the, 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 the channel, that the, the individual classical um, force that is acting on A and B actually depends on what kind of measurement you're making on the other guy. So therefore, even though you have a classical channel, because it, the channel itself can depend on the setting, you, you could go around this test and get a fake uh, entanglement. So now, um, so of course, this, this means that what you do, what you could do is uh, do a loophole free test. You can say, oh, let me, let me change my experimental setting between A and B very quickly. So, so then by causality, the other device cannot respond to my change of my setting. And in that context, you will recover stronger signatures uh, of this classical gravity model. And that, that brings me to this um, um, other, other proposal, which says, um, you know, it's a little subtle to just say if I measure my outgoing spectrum and, and try to quantify a little difference in the, in the spectrum uh, due to Schrodinger-Newton, due to that self-gravity. So there's a more, there's a stronger signature um, if you actually make a non-stationary uh, measurement. So what you could do is to say, well, uh, let me measure my test mass uh, over for a period of time, and then at t equal to zero, okay, at t equal to zero, I will stop my measurement for a while. I will let it freely evolve, and then after it freely evolves for a time tau, I, I will measure the position again. And I would like to see, as I vary this gap of evolution, um, what is the uncertainty of x at a, lar at a later time. And then here, what you, what you can see, the key is that you have a free evolution period where you're not projecting the quantum state of the mass. And therefore, you're, you're, the, this causal conditional, uh, the, 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 the feedback doesn't actually matter anymore. OK? <laughs> so it's kind of obvious, theoretically. Uh, so, so then what, what happens is that you can, you can see there are two curves here uh, that are plotted for some configurations that are shown in this uh, paper by Liu, but with a much lower temperature, okay, for the purpose of elevating the, making the, 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 the Schrodinger-Newton effect a little bigger. So, so this result will appear in a, a future paper uh, very soon. So, so the picture is that when you look at the uncertainty of this x at t plus tau, if you use quantum gravity and Schrodinger-Newton gravity, you actually have different uh, time scales at which this x would freeze, okay? So, the, so here, the red curve is the thermal decoherence curve that would just show up all the time. But then the other part of the uncertainty have to do with the quantum uncertainty. So basically, when you turn off your ex measurement, what happens are two things. One thing is your initial noise ellipse of the uncertainty ellipse will rotate in phase space, either at omega c or omega q, okay, depending on whether you have a Schrodinger-Newton effect. But then the thermal curve is um, basically have a thermal decoherence. So, and then what you see from here is that um, depending on whether you have Schrodinger-Newton or quantum gravity, you have a different eigenfrequency for the quantum noise ellipse. And that quantum noise ellipse would give a different bumps at different times, and that will um, show a different signature. So therefore, I feel like uh, the, after considering these subtleties of uh, quantum measurement, there are still parameter spaces where you can use 
where you can highlight the difference between this quantum uh, uh, gravity where there's no self-interaction and classical gravity where there is uh, self-interaction. Uh, so, and I think, okay, I didn't mention, but I think this non-stationary measurements are also promising uh, for testing the correlated word line theory that uh, Philip Stamp uh, proposed, uh, but I will not go into details of that theory. But the time scales are also very similar. So, okay, so let me then try to fit the Schrodinger-Newton model into a larger context, including some of the more recent works by uh, Oppenheim and collaborators. So, so I would like to follow the little bit of the history uh, tracks. So I, I think, so there are, I want to mention these two models of, of, uh, of uh, extensions, okay? Maybe they're extensions of Schrodinger-Newton. You can view it this way, I would say. So the one very nice model is by Nimrichter and Hornberger. And they thought about the superluminal signal transfer problem of Schrodinger-Newton very seriously, and then they added a stochastic, they added additional terms in the stochastic Schrodinger equation. And they said that if you add the stochastic terms, it'll avoid the issue of superluminal signal transfer. If, if I would like to interpret this as the following. I would say that these are stochastic unravelings of the master equations of the collapse models. So therefore, basically what they're saying is that the Schrodinger-Newton is realized by having many, many different observers in space-time uh, monitoring the positions of masses everywhere and then uh, feeding back into a classical Hamiltonian that will create gravity. So therefore, I would say this model is related to what we have here, but the source of classical information for the gravity field is not the measurement you're making, but ambient observers, ambient observers, okay? So, and the other model that uh, I want to mention is this model by uh, Caffrey, Taylor, and Milburn, which is very direct. They say that, well, let's consider gravity as a classical channel, which is established by directly monitoring the masses and then creating feedback forces on other masses. So, so the difference um, is that I think fundamentally they're very similar because either you monitor the, the spread out matter density throughout space time or you're directly monitoring each mass, the effect is very comparable. But the big difference I think is that when, when Caffrey, Taylor, Milburn feedback the gravity force, they directly take the result of measurement from each mass to as, as a feedback force. So this, this way has a lot of noise. They didn't filter the data in a, in a more, in a, in a better way, therefore to create less noise and a better estimate, but it's an instant re, um, feedback. So then with these two models, I would like to move more to the um, more recent models by uh, Oppenheim and collaborators. So the, the, the form of the equations look very different but I would like to make a similarity. I would like to draw a similarity between those because the idea is in, in these models, these are two different papers which give related, <laughs> the same model, they're related models. But the, the point is, it is always that you have a quantum and a classical system and information is being passed from the quantum system to the classical one. But when the information is being passed, there is this W and the W is the DW that you have for, you know, this is the, D, this is the DW that you have for the back action. So, you know, for a very naive person like me, I would say that, oh, they're very related. Basically, what you have is you have a bunch of observers spread out in your quantum physics. They're like spies. And these uh, spies, they monitor the, your quantum world. They give a little bit of perturbation, but they feed information to the person who generates the gravity and the gravity person generates a classical gravity. So, and therefore I would like to say, oh, at this stage we, we can say the following. We can say our quantum system, it has some classical information. Depending on the classical information that you take and the classical information that how you feedback, 
this gives you different models of classical gravity. Okay, so the first of all, the quantum system gives information to the device. If you take the device's classical data and feed back to gravity, you get Schrodinger Newton. If you have these auxiliary observers or very general framework by Oppenheim, uh, they're also kind of observers. They take classical data, they filter, and then they feed back to gravity. And of course, there's the environment. Environment also, a lot of people don't treat the environment, but if we put the environment, you have to say, oh, the environmental information has to be used to create gravity as well. So therefore, I think we can, we can put them, we can put these models in some kind of equal footing in the sense that it's all classical information being fed back. But if I have uh, five more minutes, I would like to make an even more bold claim. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, I cannot see your reactions. Maybe you don't, maybe you will think this is uh, not good. So if, if, you, if you take the collapse momentarily, let's say, if you take the collapse models as they were intended, or as you, if you, if you think about the Oppenheim model or the Caffrey Taylor and every model, if you include the measuring device and the environment into the context of your collapse models, where your, obse your auxiliary observers observe both the environment and the device, you can ask the question like which measurement is, which extraction of information is stronger? Well, I would say the measuring device and the environment are the things that are the most strongly collapsed objects, okay? So for, for example, when we think about collapse models, of course we say, oh, we test our collapse models, we test whether our quantum system suffers decoherence from the collapse models. But I think the true reason why we have the collapse models is the saying that all oh, the devices are being collapsed and that's why we have the classical reality, okay? That's what the collapse models are intended. And if you literally follow that, if you literally follow that, we have the quantum system and the device and the environment, they're all being measured and collapsed, then you have to account for that in your classical gravity model. And I would like to argue that since no collapsed models have been observed in the quantum system, then the classical information you have to feed back to generate gravity should mainly be the classical information that is gathered by the device and the environment. And in that sense, I would say the schrodinger newton theory is a very good theory because they are using the information that is being collected the most. So since Gautam has made uh, pictures, he has told a story, I would like to tell a story as well to illustrate what I'm trying to say. So let me think about an experiment with uh, the collapse models, how they, how they apply to an atomic physics experiment. In this atomic physics experiment, uh, you have the observer, okay, this is a young Sheldon, he's a physicist, he measures the atoms quantum state and he gets entangled with the, with the atoms. The, the collapse models, when you apply to this, is basically, for example, the Dioshi Peros, uh, because the atom is very light and the Sheldon is a microscopic object, um, the collapse models would choose one component of these two wave functions based on Sheldon's mass and Sheldon's microscopic motion. And he will pick the right <laughs> classical uh, reality. Okay, so this is how the collapse model work. And this is what happens if you collect information about your classical system. You collect information from the most macroscopic one. So now if you think that Sheldon is joining Marcus' lab and he's observing the levitated nanospheres. Okay, well levitated nanospheres are macroscopic objects, but the experimentalist who is more macroscopic. So, so if you think about we are gonna create gravity so the, the classical information that is going to create gravity, where is it going to come from? Well, basically, uh, Sheldon is going to be entangled with the nanosphere. And still, even though nanosphere gravitates, Sheldon is still the more massive object. And therefore, the DOC payrolls would say, oh, they will collapse Sheldon's quantum state. And therefore, if you think about this, if you say, oh, I'm going to use this classical information to create gravity, well, 
this this okay so if 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 Sheldon if the Sheldon on the right is chosen uh then um he's <laughs> he's gonna be the one that is gonna create uh, classical gravity so so therefore if you take at this picture if you say I have a self gravitating system which is very light for which the collapse models won't have strong signatures well then the collapse models are acting on the measuring device and the measuring device is the main source of classical information and therefore the Schrodinger Newton is actually the prediction of these uh, models on the other hand if you have an auxiliary observer that is very strong then they of course in that situation you will uh, create an additional decoherence and, and uh, man monitor the test mass uh, under the control of the strong observer and and then then you will see a different signature so okay so, sorry I think I'm taking a very long time so um, I, I would like to summarize uh, my, my talk um, I, I would like to say that um, testing the quantum nature of gravity needs an alternative hypothesis uh, we try to see how far we can push and uh, and then I think the conclusion is that the gravity must be driven classical gravity must be driven by classical data and then where does the classical data come from distinguishes these models of classical gravity and I would say the largest stream of classical data is the experimentalists own measurements and therefore if you use that data to create classical gravity you will return to Schrodinger Newton and therefore I would like to advocate for testing the Schrodinger Newton theory um, and then I would like to say that you can in principle unify the Schrodinger Newton theory with other classical gravity uh, models and uh, here I would like to also acknowledge my collaborators uh, in this uh, theoretical work uh, okay I will uh, stop here uh, thank you, thank you. We have time for one or two questions. We also had a um, Anupam. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. Very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. So uh, maybe at two points. Uh, first is that um, if you just measure noise, uh, it's not sufficient to say whether it's classical or quantum. You see, even my voice is a noise. Uh, yeah, I, so I from there, you cannot say unless until you do further correlations and, uh, you know, like uh, in complementary basis, like what entanglement does or what we have d shown in the case of, uh, the, you know, mm -hmm. in our paper with Sogato. So you yeah, need something I, I, like that to ensure whether, uh, you know, underlying interaction yeah. is really quantum or classical. So that's mm. the first that, point. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And the second point which I have is that you mm. see that, um, whether, whether we take a Dioshi model or CSL model or Penrose model, doesn't really matter. <laughs> they do not come from field theory. Yes. You see, after all, we have to celebrate. I mean, LSC, what LSC has given us, the results of LSC, that field theory is a very good approximation, you know, of nature. Mm -hmm. Where would it fail, after all? Mm -hmm. It doesn't reproduce you CSL theory, it doesn't reproduce you Dioshi's theory, it doesn't reproduce you Penrose theory. So why waste our time on such theories? Yeah. So I, can I address your points? Um, sure. I, I, think, I think I think the first point I, I agree. If you if you establish correlations, um, if you establish correlations between mutual objects, it's a stronger test of the quantum nature of gravity. On the other hand, I would like to argue that this Schrodinger Newton is not measuring only the noise, because for example, in here you see an evolution, okay, it is also a noise, I guess, but it's an evolution of the noise that satisfies a distinct time scale. So therefore, in light of the difficulty of measuring entanglement, I would say that this could be an intermediate thing to rule out, which could be a little bit meaningful. And with the collapse models, I, I, I also share the sentiment of uh, Philip, who, who was saying that, oh, you know, there's all these free parameters. How, where are you gonna, <laughs> when are you gonna end? Um, I, I think they are a good tool for us to think about this, uh, um, this classical, okay, so if you wanna think about classical gravity models, for, for, for example, if you look at these equations, and uh, for, for me, I was, uh, um, you know, it took me a long time to try to think like what they mean. 
And then I listened to the talk of Dan Carney, who explained very well what's what's going on here. And then I started thinking, oh, I asked him, like, is this a measurement? Uh, uh, and he said, yeah, may, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so I think, uh, therefore, thinking about these collapse models gives a way to appreciate what the contents of these theories are. But I, I agree that they are not uh, fundamental theories. Uh, they are free parameters. You, you can try to rule them out, but they they can be a context for you to perform your experiments. Like like the, um, you know, when we discuss testing relativity in gravitational waves, we test the Brand Sticky, we test the Chern-Simons theory. You know, these coefficients in front of those additional terms in the action may be very small, but we still put them there as a test. Um, it's not as exciting as uh, you know showing some positive results, but I think it gives you some kind of uh, landscape <laughs> then you can say where my landscape is yeah um no, thanks thank you yeah i really like your uh, slide it shows you that gravitational wave is impinging on your slide <laughs> thank you <laughs> um we have a question from the audience here and then uh Sugata. yeah hi uh, a comment and and a question uh, the comment is the Caffrey Taylor Milburn model is in strong disagreement with the atomic fountain experiments uh, that uh, were carried out, you know, superposed atoms falling in a gravitational field. Uh, this was pointed out in a paper by Magdalena Zeich and me and Paulina Ugaldi and Natasha Altamirano several years ago. Um, the question, though, is. All of this could be done for electromagnetism, at least in principle. Uh, so why don't we do that? Uh, the only distinction between the two is that gravity can't be shielded and electromagnetism can. But is, is that really the sufficient reason for not doing this for electromagnetism? I'm just wondering what your comments are on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry that I, I, I missed the, the experimental uh, tests. Um, uh, yeah, I, I try to say that this, this model of Caffrey Taylor Newburn, it's a very strong noise because they take the directly the output J here to feedback as a force. Therefore, the DW here is very strong. And furthermore, you have a standard quantum limit basically for gravity because if you measure if your measurement is too strong, you already have back action. And if your measurement is too weak, your noise is very high. So yeah. therefore, this model is, suffers from a huge amount of noise. Yeah, so yeah, but it doesn't agree with the atomic fountain experiments. That was my <laughs> point. But more generally, why, why wouldn't one do this any of these kinds of things for electromagnetism, in your opinion? Because I, I, I I, logically, it could be done. <laughs> that, I agree. Uh, the, the thought I had before you asked the question, obviously, would be that we have other tests that electromagnetic field is quantum. F for example, there are the tests of the fo involving single photons, et cetera. Um, and therefore, we didn't need to test for, uh, for electromagnetism. Uh, on the other hand, we can say that we, we can maintain agnostic and say, are there any components of the e electromagnetic interaction which could have such a uh, classical nature. Like, like we can do a precision test of classical remnant of electromagnetic interaction. We can put a bound on that to 10 to the minus 15. <laughs> I, I, I think that might be, that, that, that logically, uh, I think, can, uh, uh, it's a possible test. On the other hand, I think, for, I think maybe it has really maybe have to do with the nature of gravity that people would like to gain some excess of quantum aspects of gravity. And uh, therefore, we can toy with the idea that what if gravity is classical and is fundamentally different from uh, ENM? Because gravity, as formulated in GR, it's, a, it's, a man, it's like a geometry of a space-time manifold. Maybe for some reason, that manifold has a unique geometric structure on which all the wave functions of the uh, all the wave functions, all the waves of matter are, are floating around. So maybe, I think this geometric feature of gravity may be a little bit, little bit likely to believe that gravity can be a fundamentally different interaction than, than E&M. 
because you know, I think quantum mechanics was really a theory for electromagnetic interaction for many years. Um, so therefore, it's kind of built into ENM. But but for gravity, my, my personal reason for for doing yeah. this is that maybe it's uh, um, different. <laughs> one last short question from Sugaro, please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. So, um, yeah, nice talk. So, um, only thing I would like to say is that, as you said, you need specific alternative theories uh, to, yeah, in your last slide. So, you know, whenever you construct an alternative theory, right, you are kind of choosing a basis to convert the, the classic, like here in this slide is the X basis, X mm -hmm. expectation value. Mm -hmm. So. So classical theories can also be quite a lot of types, a different kind of, so whichever basis you choose, the complementary will be cohere. So, you know, there's so much uh, flexibility there that uh, you can only rule out specific classical, I mean, in other words, if you rule out a specific classical theory, you cannot be sure you have ruled out all classical theories. So that's why again, entanglement or something like that would be needed. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, for example, you can have very general theories like this one with Oppenheim, but then the thing is the, the operators here can be anything. So right. I, I share your concern. I think eventually uh, demonstrating entanglement would be very good, but I think maybe the hope is, okay, I don't know, maybe the hope is in the path toward demonstrating entanglement, if there's any deviations, maybe they will show up experimentally uh, then you will not have to, because the framework is just a placeholder for you to uh, think true. about your strategy. <laughs> Maybe oh. we don't have to believe them. I, 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 if, if nature has, if nature has selected some basis or other, we will we can find it out earlier mm -hmm. experiments. That that I agree. Perhaps. Yeah. All right. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we are late, but however, we also had a cancellation. Um, the next speaker will, will not speak. So the good news is we do also have a coffee break. We come back at 11.30 um, in half an hour. So thank you very much.